started. So um, hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for taking time out on a Saturday to join us here for this very special Young AJP event. Um, my name is Satara, and I'm the chair of Young AJP New South Wales. And I'm joined here with Kramer, who is um, the treasurer of Young AJP, and we'll both be um, your hosts for tonight. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to acknowledge the Darug people who are the traditional owners of the land on which I am on today. And I'd like to pay my respect to the elders past, present and emerging. Um, so big welcome everyone. I'm really excited to get tucked into this awesome event which has generated a lot of interest. How can we best help animals? Given the scale, neglectedness, and solvability of issues affecting animals, in particular those used for food, um, it's a really important question for animal advocates to think about. So I'm really excited to get tucked into this. Um, we have an awesome lineup of speakers here tonight across many different areas of animal advocacy. So we can really get stuck right into that question and workshop through many ideas and solutions. Today, I am joined here by Animal Justice Party New South Wales MP, the Honourable Emma Hurst, the amazing animal rights activist changing lives every day through social media, James Aspie, the brilliant co-founder of animal rights activism Sydney, Kai McBeth, the executive director and managing solicitor at Animal Defenders Office, Tara Ward, and finally, the previous acting CEO of Effective Altruism Australia and PhD candidate, Michael Deloyakovo. What a lineup. The panel will focus on how we can use the information available and the resources that we have as individuals and organizations to create as much positive change as possible for animals. Um, so how exactly is this gonna work? Well, we'll first be starting with a short talk from every panelist. Um, reflecting on their work within animal advocacy and their thoughts around the key question, how can we best help animals? Um, this will be followed by an audience Q&A and we are hoping to wrap up by 7.30 tonight. Um, now, just for some quick house rules before we get stuck into it, um, this event is being recorded. So if you do know someone who um, couldn't attend tonight, then this will definitely be available for them afterwards um, on our Young AJP YouTube channel. Or if you just wanted to rewatch it yourself one, two, ten times, it'll also be there for you too. Um, and lastly, we'd really appreciate um, if you guys can use the Q&A chat box to submit your questions during the Q&A as opposed to the general chat box. It just makes things a bit easier for Kramer and I to sort through your questions. Um, and I think that's about it all for me, unless I'm missing anything else. Um, no. Awesome. Well, without further ado, I think we're ready to get started. So I will hand it over to Kramer to start off. Thank you, Sitara. And yeah, so thanks to all our panelists and um, everyone who's tuning in or watching this on a recording for coming. Um, okay, so like Sitara said, we'll just go through... Um, the panelists now and if each of you could give just a you know five to ten minute sort of explanation of what you do with your animal advocacy activism and why you think this is effective or it's making a significant positive change for animals um if we'd start with emma hi thanks for that kramer and thanks satara and it's wonderful to be here um, so my background i've actually been involved with animal protection now for nearly 20 years and I studied psychology. I did my master's in health psychology. So health psychology really focuses on mass behavior change. How do we convince entire populations to wear a seatbelt or not to speed in their car or to quit smoking? I did my master's specifically in that because I wanted to be able to take those tools and actually put them into animal activism. We can convince entire populations that smoking's not cool and that we need to stop smoking, then we can also convince entire populations to change their diet, to change their activities on the weekends, um, all of that sort of behavior change stuff that's harming animals and to choose behaviors that don't harm animals. So I started out working specifically in that space and now I found my way into politics. And what I've found and the way I sort of understand it is there's really three pillars of change and we need to see change in all of those areas to be able to see rapid change for animals and better protection for animals across the board. So those three pillars are individual behavior change, corporate change and political and legal change. 
So individual change is that one-on-one -on -one street activism, handing out flyers, videos on the street, also public talks, social media, writing books. It's that real one-on-one -on -one communication style and it's a really great way for people to get involved. Um, I started out a lot of my activism doing that one-on-one -on -one stuff and we have found research now that shows that that kind of activism is very, very effective. It does work. There was a whole lot of research about people flying at universities and what change that that brought about. So we know that that works and it's a great way for anybody to get involved in. If you've got the gift of the gab like Kai and James here, you know, you can have those one-on-one -on -one conversations with people. If you're a little bit shy like me, you can still write stuff for social media. You can still write the flyers. You can still write books. You can still get that information out there with blogs, various other ways. The next pillar is the corporate change and you'll find most charities working specifically in this space. So I used to work for Animal Liberation, I've worked for People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, and there's a really big focus on that corporate change. And that's because you can see big changes for animals with little amounts of money. So a lot of these charities have to think about every cent that they're spending because they're coming in through donations. Um, but we're seeing, I know like when I worked at People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, we'd be working with Woolworths to increase their vegan options, for example. And we've seen this big surge in vegan options at Woolworths, at Coles, um, putting up menus in um, airlines, for example, vegan menus. And of course, all of that work makes veganism more easy, um, more normalized, and of course, cheaper. And all of that work helps on that individual um, level as well on that one-on-one -on -one work that's also being done. The third pillar is political and legal change. And this is the most neglected and the hardest area to get change for animals. Um, and it's being neglected because it's so hard. So if you think about the greyhound racing ban and the overturn that came in through government, when you think about what our governments have done on the live export ships um, and the refusal to move on these industries. But the other areas, individual change and uh, corporate change are so affected by what happens within that political and legal change. And it's the one area where we have completely ignored the need for a voice for animals in parliament and even though we have two elected MPs now, I can tell you every other issue that comes up on the agenda, where there's legislation, there's lobby groups, there's massive protests, um, there's people knocking on your doors, constantly wanting to talk about an issue. Every time we put up something for animals, there's absolute dead silence. There's no lobby groups. There's no one interacting within that political space. It is just us. Um, and, and that's not great for animals. But to explain how um, that political change is so important for those other two areas. If you think about the fact that, so if you take, if, if Kai and James suddenly ran this fantastic campaign that managed to get 2% more vegans, um, so that would be a significant shift and we would see drops in, in the sale of animal products. But what would the government do? The government would step in and subsidize the industry to prop them up and keep them going. So it makes that change much harder and a much more long journey to actually get to where it is that we want to be in animal protection. And I have seen this happening just recently. Um, last week I sat in, um, I was a deputy chair on a dairy inquiry looking into the sustainability of the dairy industry. Now, Labor, Nationals, Liberals, Shooters were also on the inquiry and all of their position was their industry is failing, we need to throw money at them. We need to prop them up to survive, get them to survive. Let's start putting free milk in schools. Let's give milk five-star health ratings, even though they failed um, to get that past nutritionists. And that's, that's their opinion. How do we get people to stop buying more plant milks and either get them back to dairy and prop up the industry in the meantime? I was the only person at the table saying, well, actually, if consumers are moving away from dairy consumption towards plant-based consumption, we should be using that money to actually help farmers transition to what consumers are demanding, which is plant-based. Um, and, and it was almost like speaking another language. Nobody else on this panel had even considered that. Um, so 
you can sort of see how the government can actually stop the work that we're doing in those other spaces. So we really need people in all three areas, um, but happy to um, answer any questions about, about that or psychology or anything later on. Excellent, thanks, Emma. Um, okay, so James, would you like to, and guys, feel free to put your questions in now, anyone who, who's watching, um, and, and we can do them at the end of the um, sort of introductory section. Cool. Thanks. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, and thanks for that, Emma. Very interesting. And as you mentioned, I focus mostly on the individual change kind of level. Um, for me, when I started learning about animal rights and veganism, I felt like veganism needed a really good PR team because they vegans just seem to have such a bad rep. And, um, you know, seen as aggressive, judgy, preachy, annoying, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I just felt like uh, something that I would be able to do, you know, because the, the question is, how can, how do we best help animals? I think the answer is very person dependent. So it depends on what your skills are, what your talents are, what your passion is, your motivation, and how you think you can best help. So for me, I thought I could best help through um, trying to basically showcase the vegan lifestyle through my own personal journey of being a vegan, showing a wide variety of different things from what I eat to the things I've learned about the industries, um, the health benefits, showing that you can be a healthy, fit, strong vegan. And then on top of um, basically just the day to day, how to live as a vegan. I felt that it would be beneficial to do certain stunts that would draw attention to me, which would draw attention to what I talk about every single day, which is animal rights. So the first thing I did was take a year long vow of silence and um, travel around Australia at the same time, assuming that people would find that interesting. They'd never heard of someone doing that before. They'd follow the journey. I'd post a balance of who I am, what I'm doing, you know, this, that, the other, and then some of the heavy stuff, some of the sanctuary stuff, and again, just a wide variety of um, different things all related to animal rights. And, and basically going with the, um, the direction of figuring out what people's objections are to this lifestyle, and then trying to handle those points one at a time. So for example, people thinking that you can humanely slaughter animals, explaining as, in as many ways as possible how humane slaughter is an oxymoron, and doesn't actually exist. Um, explaining, yeah, just basically um, the, the objections people have thinking that it's not healthy and this and that. And uh, what I found was more beneficial than anything was to do all of these things, have these one-on-one -on -one conversations, go and do speeches once my vow of silence was over, um, you know, live the lifestyle. But on top of all of that, by far the best thing about all of, about living a vegan, living a vegan lifestyle is that we can put it on social media now. And these street conversations we have, which actually change people's lives. You know, you speak to somebody on the street about veganism, and they've never heard this perspective before or really gone into it before. It is so logical that it is bound to shift people's perspectives a lot of the time. And to be able to take that one conversation, this life-changing conversation, and to multiply that by putting it on social media and multiplying the views by, by a thousand, thousand, even a million or even more has been um, you know, something that is so, so valuable, so, so useful, something that each and every one of us can do. You know, and it doesn't have to be like Emma was saying, if you're not feeling so confident about doing this one-on-one -on -one conversation, you know, or even to talk on the camera and things like that, we all have an audience of a couple hundred people at the very least, generally. We can at least show what we're eating and just show how we live this lifestyle kind of thing. And then just being consistent, uploading ideally daily and um, just keeping in your mind the objective of understanding people's objections, the things holding them back from why they can't be vegan, um, the, the points that you found uh, very interesting and convincing and then just sharing this in as many creative different ways as possible to try to reach a wide variety of people um, and planting seeds constantly and um, yeah, just being consistent with it. 
So that's basically what I've focused on over the years. The things that I've found most, um, most easy to go viral are public speaking, because uh, generally if someone's doing a speech, they have something worthwhile to say, and those um, types of videos go very well. And on top of that, the debate discussion type videos, people want to see who's going to win, what's going to happen, this kind of thing. So yeah, I've had some good success with that. I've found that, um, you know, just chipping away at people, just, you know, people might follow, for example, my work for many years and, you know, years later, they start to think, well, all right, now I get it. That video I saw a few years ago, all right, I think about that differently now from how I observed it the first time. And I'm um, just being aware that this is a process for a lot of people. And, um, you know, also being aware that the behavior change is only a part of it. Getting people to make these changes and everything is very, very important to change the whole perspective of who they see animals as. Because I think that's one of the core problems with why we don't have a vegan world right now. Is people just as completely confused about who animals even are and why they should matter to them and things like that. And um, yeah, that's basically it. Just just spreading the message um, to raise awareness and educate. Awesome. Thanks for that, James. Uh, okay, Tara. I think you're, you're muted. I. Oh, sorry. There you go. How's that? How's that? <laughs> Is that good? Yeah, Great. good. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Emma and James. That was um, a, a, an amazing um, or amazing insights. Uh, and I would like to, um, just before I start, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm participating in this event here in Canberra, actually, on stolen land to which sovereignty has never been ceded. And I acknowledge its traditional owners and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So thank you very much for the invitation to participate in this panel. And just a quick word about myself for those who don't know about me or the Animal Defenders Office. Uh, so I'm the volunteer managing solicitor for the Animal Defenders Office, which is a community legal center that provides free legal advice and assistance on matters relating to animals. And that also advocates for law reform to better protect animals. So the Animal Defenders Office is run entirely by volunteers, including myself, and uh, we receive no government funding. So while we're a specialist centre in one sense, in that we deal with legal matters relating to animals, we're also a generalist centre in that we practice or at least dabble in uh, many different areas of the law from the constitution down basically uh, to admin, criminal, tort, consumer law, etc. What we don't do is to just to sort of uh, yeah clarify what what we do um, and, and the perspective that I'm coming from is that we don't um, investigate or prosecute uh, for animal cruelty matters because we don't have the necessary powers to do that under state and territory animal cruelty laws. So those powers are confined to, to the police or government departments, depending on the jurisdiction, um, and private charities, of course, like the RSPCA or in New South Wales Animal Welfare League. So firstly, in talking about advocating through the law, I thought I should um, dispel the idea that uh, being an animal lawyer is the glamour role that we might think it is, you know, heading into court, addressing the judge with an impassioned speech about the rights of animals and saving hundreds of sentient creatures from a grisly fate. It's not that. It's largely a lot of hard, hard work. I think Emma sort of alluded to the hard work that's sort of um, endemic in this uh, space, uh, doing endless legal research and writing advices or submissions, compiling evidence and court documents, and often for one animal at a time. But this is the important thing about animal law, and just to sort of clarify this as well, um, it's a support service. So we're not there getting the animals out of the cages, but we're there to assist people who may do that kind of thing and then end up on the wrong side of the law, and also to assist any other frontline animal advocate who needs legal help. So advocating for animals through the law is definitely not for everyone, because most of the time you are at least once removed from the action. It's not direct action. So if you have that voice inside your head that's urging you to be an activist, then being an animal lawyer may not be for you. So um, I was, or am, an activist first and foremost. Uh, I couldn't do what I do as an animal lawyer if I hadn't first been an activist. 
And that's because the law is too slow, it's too clumsy, it's too time consuming. It's basically, uh, again, as Emma alluded to, it's too hard a way to achieve change for animals. I would find it frustrating if I didn't have that other outlet, that one-on-one, one-to-one -on -one, one -one outlet for advocacy and communication. So I do like to keep my hand in and go to rallies and protests and leafleting and marches and a thousand eyes, we call it here in Canberra, um, uh, which I think is the sort of cube idea when I can. Now that I am a lawyer, I can find my direct action to this kind of um, activities rather than engaging in civil disobedience, for example. Uh, you probably could do that and still keep your practicing certificate, but would be it would be a bit uh, a big risk. So choosing to do the law, you probably have to give up on any idea of civil disobedience uh, yourself. So for some people, they know that that kind of advocacy, they already know that that kind of advocacy is not for them. So the law is perfect. It's providing that support to advocates who end up needing legal assistance because they are out on the front line and possibly engaging in civil disobedience or people who have never um, or who have other ways of testing the law and pushing its boundaries. And that's one of the definite pluses of being an animal lawyer, I'd say. And that's developing this expertise in certain um, certain sort of areas and aiming at being good at analysing the problems with the current regulatory frameworks that apply to both animals and animal advocates and working out possible solutions or ways to improve them because we know the system from the inside because we practice in it. So developing that kind of expertise brings with it a great deal of satisfaction but it also takes a very long time. So it's not a quick and uh, easy option. You could spend a lifetime practicing in animal law and still be developing expertise at the end of your career in the very, very many areas of the law that you you'd end up dabbling in. And the law, I'd also say that the law is pretty brutal. It's, it's high, high pressure. Uh, preparing matters for tribunals or courts or parliamentary inquiries is intense and very time consuming. So being a rookie lawyer, but, but being up against, say, senior barristers or crown solicitors or before stern judges or conservative politicians is hugely intimidating. So you have to be able to bear that kind of pressure if that's what the sort of um, path that you go down as an animal lawyer. Now, a definite thing in its favour is gaining recognition from and the respect of the wider legal profession and other professionals. So um, in other words, a definite role of the animal lawyer and perhaps in, partic in particular community animal lawyers is to bring animals into the conversation within the legal profession about equal access to justice for the vulnerable and the disadvantaged in our society. So that general conversation is happening now, but it's, anthropos it's in inevitably and inherently anthropocentric. In other words, it includes, it excludes, I should say, it excludes non-human animals. And we're there to remind the profession, the profession that animals are among the most disadvantaged beings on earth and that they deserve equal access to justice and to representation in our legal system. And animal lawyers are here to give them that. And whether we wanted to or not, we definitely also help people as well. I can't tell you how many people are so relieved when they find the ADO, the Animal Defenders Office, and to be talking to people within the legal uh, system who understand their intense anguish and despair and desperation to help defend or get justice for their animals. I mean, we may, we may even end up helping more people than we help animals, uh, possibly, uh, because we are providing that direct service to people. But this can also be a form of advocacy. So we get the opportunity to interact or help people whom we otherwise may not ordinarily interact with or be able to influence. Uh, they're, they're completely outside the movement, uh, but through the relationship that we develop with them, uh, the client lawyer relationship, you open their eyes to other animal issues other than the direct issue that they're dealing with. So for example, coming to our small office, which is where I am now, uh, where we have a sign that says, um, out of respect for those whom we defend, thank you for not eating or drinking animal products in this office. So often our clients have never come across vegans or had anything to do with a plant-based diet. 
And this, this one on one again interaction gets them thinking about it. So, for example, we've got one public housing tenant client at the moment who is convinced that they're going to start a vegan cheese business after we got to talking about what vegans eat. And they got over their initial surprise that there was even such a thing as vegan cheese. And this client will specially look out for vegan snacks in the supermarket to bring to the office for our client conferences. So finally, in thinking about this webinar tonight, I remembered being at one of those university law student career forums uh, where they had various representatives from public law organisations to talk uh, about having a career or at least practising in one of these areas of public law. And the students had actually invited the ADO to be part of the panel, so I went along. And one of the students asked how animal lawyers coped with being exposed to all that animal cruelty and suffering. And I remember thinking of three things in reply, which I'll finish with tonight. So firstly, as lawyers, we're removed from the worst. We're not in the sheds seeing, hearing, smelling the suffering and the atrocities. We're spending our time looking at legislation and cases, advices, submissions, etc. So we have that kind of buffer, which, you know, in a sense can be a positive thing. Again, we're that one, uh, at least one step removed. Secondly, uh, you have to love the law. So often, Advocates will come to us with inquiries that simply have not been asked before. There's no precedent, there's no pathway that was discovered long ago that simply gets, gets regurgitated thereafter. So you will spend forever sifting through obscure bits of legislation, trying to piece together how it works and trying to work out the legal basis for something that an animal advocate has just asked for the first time. So for us, an exciting shift in the office can be spending hours trying to work out the correct statutory time limit, for example, for applying for review of a decision under a particular act. And you actually have to enjoy doing that, otherwise it would just drive you nuts. Finally, uh, you're inspired to keep at it as an animal lawyer by working and collaborating with other lawyers and volunteers and advocates with whom we're sharing um, th this evening. Uh, and, and who share the same zeal or passion that you have for both animal law and, of course, for the animals themselves. So um, I'll just leave it there and hand over, hand back to the panel. Thank you, Tara. Awesome. Um, okay, Michael. Thanks, Grandma. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I've got a presentation. Can people see my PowerPoint? Yep, I can see it. Okay, awesome. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, everyone um, who is on, is on the panel and has organized tonight. And also thanks to everyone uh, for tuning in. So my name is Michael, and I'm going to be talking about um, animal advocacy in the context of effective altruism. So um, effective altruism is a global movement that uh, got its name in about 2009. Um, but the ideas have probably been around for a lot longer. And it's just the idea of there are a lot of problems in the world that we would like to fix, uh, but we have limited time and resources. So it's about how can we most effectively use those time and resources to do as much good as we can. Um, and of course, there's a lot of overlap between that um, and animal advocacy, but not just exclusive to animal advocacy, also in uh, global health and other, um, other areas. So I did, I did have a... A couple of questions that I was going to um, get people to think about, but I, I suspect I won't have time for that. So instead, I'm just going to give one example, and you'll see where I'm going with this in um, just a moment. Uh, so the example is of a charity called Play Pumps. Uh, they were a very well-intentioned program to um, to get uh, new wells to produce water in rural areas in Africa. Um, that needed uh, access to water. The idea was uh, it's it's a one of those uh, spinning. I don't have a photo, sorry, but it's a spinning uh, kind of merry-go-round that you see in playgrounds that uh, kids like to spin on. And it was it would function as a, uh, a toy, but also it would pump water from the ground whilst the kids were playing on it. So the idea was uh, the kids would play on this, and it would produce water for the village and be a win-win. Um, this is very well intentioned, but unfortunately, what ended up happening is. Uh, if um, if the children were spinning on this, it was very difficult to actually uh, to um, spin around. The kids would have to be constantly pushing it because it's actually pumping water. So it doesn't function very well as a as a toy. Um, and 
it's actually not a very good pump either because it's not designed as a pump. So it did neither job very well. And in the end, it turned out that to produce enough water for the village, people would have to be push pumping this uh, play pump for about 25 hours a day. So it um, was very well intentioned, but ended up being worse than just uh, um, putting in a regular well for the village. So the point I'm trying to make here is it's really hard sometimes to know what works in social interventions. Uh, I, I, I picked an, this example because, and not an animal example, because uh, there just isn't very much research in this space for non-human interventions. So it's hard to know what works. And at least for um, human-focused social interventions of rigorously evaluated programs, uh, a full 75% end up having little to no effect with some even having, unfortunately, a negative effect. Now, um, so I'd like to make the case that we should always be considering the effectiveness of any intervention that we do. But So why should we do this? Many people think it's an, enough to donate to charities that are honest or enough to do things that are well-intentioned, um, uh, you know, have, a, have a positive intention. However, many honest and great charities and programs have programs that uh, don't work and can in some rare cases be even harmful. So uh, honest charities try to do good, but our intuition tends to not be very good at picking good charities or good programs and knowing what interventions work. So we have to try and, and look at the data. So what is the importance of setting goals and metrics? First, uh, before we even try and optimize for an ideal outcome, we need to think about what is it they're actually trying to achieve? So what, what, do, we, what do we want to do and how can we measure that to improve on that? So uh some some ideas that people might have of what we're trying to achieve is is it to create more vegans is it to uh, produce less suffering for non-humans is it for less animals to be exploited there is overlap between these but uh the best way of doing one of these might not be the best way of doing another so we have to think about what is it that we ultimately care about um and i'd probably say i'd say that probably the first one is really just a, a proxy for what we're actually trying to do. It's, it's to, to have more vegans uh, is great, but that's only good because it would be as expect that to result in fewer animals suffering. So I want to talk a little bit about um, just why there is a focus on farmed animals in the animal advocacy movement. Um, so on the left here, we have a graph of the number of animals used and killed in um, uh, different areas of animal exploitation. This is these are figures from the US. The vast majority of animals used and killed are in farms, uh, killed for food or for clothing. Um, sorry, the the, the, light, the blue is just for uh, animals used and killed for farm in for food. Then there's animals used and killed in labs, animals used and killed in um, animals who sorry end up in shelters, and animals used and killed for clothing. So it's obviously dominated by animals in farms. But when you look at the amount of money donated to uh, animal charities, most of the animal charity donations go towards uh, shelters. Uh, but you could argue that the scale of animals used and killed in farms is much greater and also much more neglected in terms of where funding is going. So I'd, I'd say that's a reason why there should be more of a focus on um, the farmed animal space. Um, I think I'm, I'm just going to skip this for time. So. We, I mentioned before that we sometimes use creating an extra vegan, converting extra vegan, however you want to say, as um, being a metric. Um, so if we're going to do that, we need to understand what impact on the lives of animals does having an extra vegan actually do. So these aren't probably the latest figures, but um, as of 2012 at least, the average meat-eating American consumes 30 land animals per year, including uh, 28 chickens. Um, the average, and then for marine animals, it's 46 to 79 uh, marine animals, and then plus an additional 186 shellfish per year, mostly shrimp. Uh, two egg laying hens are required per person per year. One dairy cow per 30 people per year. One lab animal experimented on per 15 people per year, and one animal killed per 100 people per year uh, on average. So, when we think about create, turning someone from being a uh, member of the average population to being a vegan, we might expect something like this impact. But it is a little bit trickier because 
um, due to uh, supply and demand e elasticity, one fewer product produced, um, one fewer product purchased does not necessarily equal one fewer product produced. So it depends on the on the product and some other factors, but one estimate puts the impact of one extra vegan consuming 30 fewer land animals results in um, 1.8 to 21 fewer animals being farmed, which is a big range, um, but that's just because one fewer person buying um, some products is not necessarily equal to that many fewer products being produced. Uh, and same for marine animals. They're also very hard to measure longer term effects. A lot of things that we do in any intervention has unforeseen long-term consequences. I think Emma gave a really good example of this before, which is that uh, as, we, as um, fewer people consume dairy, that uh, doesn't have quite as strong an impact as we might think because it results in it maybe increased gov government intervention uh, to prop up the industry. So we have to accept that that does diminish the impact a little bit of uh, fewer people consuming dairy products. Uh, there's also the unfortunate fact that not everyone who becomes vegan will stay vegan. I think I've I got a red dot there. Um, yeah, so over time, uh, on average, people who become vegan stop being vegan. It's unfortunate, but um, that's definitely reality. Uh, however, there's some research by Fawn Livics in 2014 suggested that um, uh, despite that, focusing on uh, Focusing on convincing more people to be vegan is still more effective at this time than trying to reduce recidivism of existing vegans. So how should this information inform direct activism or any intervention, anything that we do to try and help animals? I think the key takeaway I want people to think about today is just that we should always be open-minded and be careful not to assume that any intervention or any uh, project, outreach, activism that we do definitely has an intended def sorry definitely has a positive desired effect just because we have good intentions there's always the risk that we're not being as effective as you could be and there's even a risk that we might be doing some harm so i think we as long as we are open-minded and thinking about how can we be more effective then that's the main thing i want people to take away from tonight um so i think i will leave it there these are just some organizations of um people that are doing some research into various, uh, looking at different interventions and how effective they are and um, doing some research about how we can best help animals. So thank you. All right, thank, oh, am I, am I on? I think I am on. Um, thanks for that, Michael. Sorry, my headset's sounding very unusual. Um, okay, Kai. Hi, okay, awesome. Um, I'll try to keep this fairly short and sweet. Um, Two things before I sort of start on this. Um, I apologize if there's any background noise. It's sort of relevant uh, that I'm actually here on this call after um, one of our Cuba Truth events just finished up in Sydney. Um, I'm actually sitting in Lentils Anything, one of Sydney's best vegan restaurants. That's why there's stacks of soy milk behind me. Um, but so if there's any background noise, please excuse that. Um, and before I start on anything, I just wanted to say thank you to the Young Animal Justice Party. Thank you to Sister Sarah and Kramer for organizing this event. And I just wanted to express how much of a privilege it is to be able to be on an event with panelists such as these. I admire you all so, so deeply for such a variety of reasons, whether it's the effectiveness of your advocacy, the clarity of your thought, or defending me in court. So um, I guess what I want to go through in regards to talking about, so the primary thing I focus on, I've, I've sort of, as an activist, I've, I've been a full-time activist for about three years, um, been a sort of regular activist for about four, and I've, I've sort of got my foot in a fair few different realms, but I'd say the primary thing that I've, over the years, probably put most of my time into is public outreach and public activism and grassroots activism. So essentially my overarching goal, at least nowadays, is to help cultivate and help thrive grassroots activism communities. And so in speaking about public outreach, the primary things I wanna cover is, I wanna talk about what it is, and then I'll give you some ideas of sort of the types that there is and the ways it manifests as demonstrations. And then what I'll go over is why I think it's effective. But in that, I wanna talk pretty transparently about what I think are weaknesses in the public act, uh, like public outreach sphere, but also what I think are our greatest strengths. So 
in regards to really what is public outreach or what form it takes and you know public outreach has existed for you know as, as long as people have been able to talk to other people about animal rights public outreach has existed right but um in its modern form at least here in sydney um it's probably existed pretty strongly for about the past five years now and i'd say there's two real cornerstones to what we do in the sort of modern public outreach scene and those two cornerstones are one the use of innovative tactics and technology and two the use of effective outreach i think that's what differentiates the sort of modern scene and modern movement from what may have existed in the past particularly on the on the technology part and so the way those two cornerstones might manifest is that in using innovative tactics or technology um, a, a common probably the most prevalent public outreach demonstration around the world is something called the cube of truth if you're not familiar with it it's simply a public outreach demonstration where people stand holding television screens and the television screens play um, usually local footage of animal slaughter and animal cruelty and animal treatment for food um, where the people are and so what that allows us to do is it allows us to go direct to the public and show them exactly what's happening and then the second component of that is effective outreach where members of the demonstration who aren't holding TVs will speak to the public and not necessarily try to persuade, but try to educate the public about what they're seeing, what's going on and what's truly going on in the food industries. And then encourage those people to follow through with a plant-based diet or a vegan lifestyle in aligning their actions with their values. And so the different types of ways that these forms of public outreach manifest is um as i said <laughs> cat um as i said prior explained prior the cube of truth is probably the most um popular and um sort of well-established form of outreach in the world but there's other forms similar to the cube of truth that use essentially tvs on the street um the earthings experience is one i think tara mentioned um thousand eyes experience as well um in almost every corner of the globe there's something along those lines um, other forms that it takes that are sort of a little bit lesser known in Sydney, um, even predating the Cube of Truth, the longest running form of sort of modern public outreach has been something we call the University Cupcake Challenge here in Sydney. Um, that was actually my first ever public activism or outreach experience. Um, James Aspen was there as well. Um, and what we essentially do is go into universities, we collaborate with usually university vegetarian sorry not vegetarian vegan sometimes vegetarian if they can get us in um we collaborate with vegan societies and animal rights societies and we go in essentially um offer students vegan baked goods in exchange for sitting down and properly engaging with a video um, about animal slaughter and animal treatment and then we go through essentially the same routine of trying to employ effective outreach to those people to educate them and um, push them towards aligning their actions with their values. And there's a few other types that are, are a little bit less common, but perhaps coming more common. Um, there's types that we've developed over the past two years with sort of truly cutting edge technology that we've employed where we go and do similar public outreach and showing the public footage like we do with the Cuba Truth, but we use mobile TV screens. So we're not tethered to a static demonstration. We actually go around public spaces and it's, it's sort of a little bit more disruptive, a bit more direct action sort of feel, but there is a large outreach component as well. And once again, we employ, try to employ the same type of effective outreach. And then there's even more emerging things. Um, there's a couple of, um, activists that I'm very fond of here in Sydney who simply go up and dress in animal onesies who are very, very proficient at effective outreach and have sort of established themselves as almost like lo local, local legends around some parts of the Northern suburbs here in Sydney. And they'll pump out hundreds of flyers and you know many, many, many outreach conversations with the public every week. Um, so that's the sort of types of form that Anna, sort of animal rights public outreach can manifest as. And in regards to why I think it's effective, but like I said, I want to start with what I think is the weak point of public outreach and what I think is lacking is that really what is lacking with public outreach is, is research um, and research into effectiveness. And it's not that it's necessarily ineffective, but it's a little bit of a guess. And that's been the way it has been for a while now. Animal advocacy methods are notorious for being pretty poor on their research, but public outreach, particularly one, because it's it's quite hard to track. We can't go and hire private investigators to see if someone who we talk to a month later is consuming milk solids. And so 
with that, I think that's probably the part of public outreach that needs the most development and we want to push forward for what I think is the strongest part of public outreach, particularly the public outreach grassroots activism scene is the sense of community. And I sort of, I, I want to explain really briefly why I think that's really important, but better yet, I want to show you the power of adult rights outreach communities. Give me one second. So, say hi. It's a, little, it's a little dark, but you get the impression, right? So that's about 30 of our activists there who have just come from the, the Cuba Truth. Um, we're all sitting together and watching this event um, in a restaurant. And really what having a really, really strong ability to generate community and I would say movement building in and of itself is it allows a number of things. One, it, it, public outreach remains probably, I would, I would vouch for, um, particularly the Cuba Truth, probably the most highly accessible form of public, um, like, animal advocacy that there is. Um, literally all people have to do to join our events is look when the event is on Facebook, rock up to the event, and that's it. We take on the rest from there. And so being highly accessible allows a really, really large amount of people to come in to what we do. And then what that allows it is that apart from, you know, demonstrable effectiveness as to how much of we are getting people to change, there's a, there's a big role it plays in developing the movement itself in that having being able to bring in so many people with such a highly accessible form of advocacy. What I've seen over the many, many years is that the, particularly the Cuba Truth here in Sydney, but grassroots outreach in general, it acts as what I would sort of explain to be sort of like an activism funnel in that you get all these new activists or like vegans who are taking action for the first time. They spend certain times in Cuba Truth and some of them stay around the Cuba Truth, some don't, but so many of them start in the Cuba Truth or start in public outreach and then split off to other forms of advocacy that they learn about through engaging with the community that we have pre-existing here. So I know tons of people who, you know, tons of people who still participate or have participated in the past who are now in the investigation scene, who are now in the politics scene, who are now in the you know, more towards effective autism scene. So the grassroots public outreach scene access is sort of beautiful activism funnel and almost like an activism incubator as well in that there's such a multifaceted set of ideas and viewpoints that people have and at, you know, being able to come to restaurants after an event or engage socially with each other after an event. Those ideas are able to co-mingle and really develop activists from the, the sort of bottom up. And I guess lastly, one of the reasons that I think, and once more, this is in regards to the movement itself and why I think public outreach communities are so effective is it, it's, it's a sense of empowerment and that it allows particularly both vegans and pre-existing activists um, in speaking to the public, regardless of the data of how effective it is speaking to the public, there's a true sense of being able to resonate with the public and having good conversations and meaningful conversations with people empowers activists to go and bring that into their other forms of advocacy. And whether it's learning strategies and learning techniques that allow them to speak to people face to face, being able to have a good conversation with someone about animal rights is a really, really foundational core skill that you can carry to almost any other form of activacy, even if you're not talking to people on the street. So those are the primary reasons as to why I think it is effective. Um, and like I said, they largely orientate around not necessarily the outreach in itself, but what it means for the greater and larger community as a whole. So that's about it. Excellent. Thank you, Kai. Um, and thanks to all the panelists for giving sort of an introduction to themselves and their, their advocacy work. Um, so we'll just get started with sort of audience Q&A now. So anyone who's watching, if you've got any questions, please put them in the Q&A dialogue box thing. Um, so I think most of these are fairly applicable to everyone. So if you want to say something, just jump in. Um, if there are any that are directed to particular people, I'll uh, let you know. So there are a couple of people here who have asked about, um, I suppose, two sort of similar things here. So one is um, engaging, how do you engage sort of convincingly when you're trying to talk to people about you know, animal ethics, animal rights, veganism, that sort of thing. Um, particularly, I think as a young person, um, they say they find it hard to um, hold back tears. So obviously getting quite upset about it. And there's a related question about um, dealing with the sort of trauma you experience from being so aware of these issues and like, you know, seeing slaughter footage and, you know, perhaps um, going to slaughterhouses and these sorts of things. So this is for anyone, if anyone's got any suggestions on sort of communicating and 
dealing with these sorts of emotional um, traumas? Uh, I have some things I could say about that for sure. Um, I think that for me at least, and I think a lot of people, there is a feeling of uh, guilt if you are happy knowing all the injustice and the suffering and the cruelty out there. And I think that's something we should definitely let go of. Um, I don't think that us forcing ourselves to suffer helps animals or furthers the cause. Um, it can be motivational. So I wouldn't say it's always bad. You can funnel your anger and frustration into action. But I think overall, um, something that helps me stay positive, stay happy, is two things. One, I remember that most people are just like me in that when they when it clicks for them and they understand why they should be vegan, a lot of people do start moving in that direction. And it's just about getting them up to that point. So realizing that the people that you're speaking to, there is hope with them. And every conversation and seed planted is worthwhile, even if you don't see the fruits of that conversation. And also just as I kind of mentioned earlier when I was saying if we seem very emotional about this topic, um, it can be helpful, but also I think it can take away sometimes from just the facts, which are so powerful at influencing people to change and become aware of what's happening. And, um, and I think that if you are trying to influence people to adopt your lifestyle, then one of the wisest ways to do that is to be someone that they can approach very easily, not having to worry about tiptoeing around the conversation, be able to just comfortably ask you the questions that they have. And ideally, your responses will be very level headed, not from an emotional place, you'll be able to um, also show that you can live life as a happy, healthy, positive vegan and not as somebody who you know, no matter where they look, they see animal cruelty and it just kind of ruins their life. I think that um, keeping in mind that being a positive vegan and showing how amazing this lifestyle is, is actually a much more attractive um, way to attract people to the lifestyle. So even though you might feel like you should be mad and you should be upset and we all have every right to be because what's happening is absolutely insanely, shockingly bad, but also coming with the strategy, you know, with the knowledge that um, when you are shining your brightest and someone that they can ask these questions to, um, you'll probably find that your answers will land on them in a better way. And that by being a good representation of this lifestyle and um, being more of the attributes that people want to be, which is happy and healthy and um, consistent in their morals and things like this, I think that we can have a much better shot. So I don't think that, you know, I think that the, the feeling of feeling like we need to be, uh, feel guilty and sad and, and come from this place is probably sometimes doing more harm than good. And so just allow yourself, you know, I would say just allow yourself that you are allowed to be happy, even though so many others are suffering and, you know, you um, deserve to be happy. You definitely deserve to be happy. You're a vegan and you're, you're on the right side suffering with them isn't gonna necessarily help. Awesome, thanks Thank so much. Oh yeah, you're, yeah, you guys know, I was not sure who was going there. Yeah. <laughs> I was waiting for you, but I wasn't sure. Um, awesome, thanks so much, James. Did anyone else on the panel um, have any other input for that question? Well, we can go yeah, if I can have maybe a little bit to that and I'll, I'll keep it really brief. Um, I think the outcome of how you feel after engaging directly with people about animal rights is it's not inherently going to be traumatic. I think it's, a, it's all dependent on the types of conversations you're having, right? And I think that's a really important to figure out when you're... Fuck, um, it's really important to figure out in that it depends on the types of people you're engaging with. Typically, I think most people find engaging with family and friends will typically lead to outcomes in which they are leaving those conversations feeling emotionally jarred, feeling like it was very difficult and feeling all in all not really good about what happened. There's a very, very, very big difference. And I, I say it to people whenever I, I speak to them when they're at their first type of like Cuba Truth event in that speaking to 
essentially random people on the street is far, 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 far easier and has a far, far, far better outcome almost always than speaking to a million friends. And so what I would advocate for if people are finding that when they do or they feel like they're going to engage with people directly in regards to animal rights, think about the types of conversations you're going to be having. Spare your family and friends for now and realize that there's no morally meaningful difference between your mother going vegan and some random person's mother going vegan on the street, right? One of those is going to be much easier than the other conversations have and it's going to leave you feeling much better. Yeah, awesome. That's a really good point. Thanks, Kai. Um, the next question I wanted to talk about was to do with culture and religion. So um, we've got a question here about um, living in a multicultural society such as Australia. Um, there are many different ethnic groups and people who historically, ethnically and religiously find it acceptable to consume and abuse animals. So how do we enter in discourse and discussion with them as to the benefits and beliefs of a plant-based diet when their culture supports and believes animal consumption is right um, and often reflected in their texts? Um, this sort of ties into someone else's question as well, that the stats show that slaughter of animals is increasing in a lot of um, developing nations, um, such as India and China. Um, so veganism is expen exponentially growing in developed countries um, and actually growing backwards worldwide as the population grows. So does anyone have any comments on the cultural aspects of veganism? Um, I might just start just by addressing that second part of your question, and it actually goes back to some of our own advocacy. Um, it is increasing in other countries, but that's also coming from different groups within our country who are trying to sell to those countries. Um, I actually received emails some years ago, um, and people, um, depending on how young or old you are, might remember the whole... Um, the whole issue with the dairy industry who got caught out for actually trying to convince people in Africa that um, their formula milk was much better than breast milk um, and they were advertising it as such to try to increase their sales. The emails that I have seen um, came from different people very high up in meat and dairy industries and they saying that, um, and it was between Australia and Great Britain, and the companies were actually saying that in Great Britain and Australia, the trend is going down. And so they said, we have to create a new market. And the new market is the people that don't have the information about health, that don't have the information about animal cruelty. Um, so we need to actually sell our products to countries that aren't consuming these, like meat and dairy. Um, so they, they, and they're calling them the new market. So that's happening, um, but it's happening because um, the typical sort of Western world, um, or what I like to call the uh, minority countries, um, are now switching their food consumptions. And so those industries are now focusing and they're setting up intensive farms in majority countries like Africa and India, where the majority of people live um, and they can sort of take advantage there, but it's, it's going to be a massive um, disaster. I do know that there's a lot of advocacy groups around the world, like Mercy for Animals, that are very well aware of this. We need to be mindful in all of our advocacy work that we don't just push the issue overseas um, and, and sort of force these, well, not force, but um, allow these industries to create these new markets. Um, so, so that's sort of my insight on that on that part of. It. I know there was two sections of that question. I'm sure somebody else can give a good response to the other part. Awesome. Thanks so much, Emma. Um, Does anyone else have anything to say about um, that question? Yeah, I guess I could, if I can add really briefly, and that was such a fantastic um, answer, Emma, um, on engaging with people who use cultural or religious values to justify the exploitation of animals. Um, typically the way I view things in the sort of outreach system that I employ, the outreach system I teach, in that almost all, at least religious justifications for continued support of, of commercial animal abuse, uh, what I term as essentially non-justifications, in that you mentioned the, you know, having religious texts support the this practice, but essentially what these religious texts say is they, they provide a choice, right? Obviously, as most of us would probably know that no religious text mandates the consumption of animals. 
And so what's going on there is the religious text is providing a choice. And it's providing a framework of choice, right? But the individual within that framework is still being forced to make the choice. And so at least for myself, whenever I speak to people who bring up religion or religious text as a justification to support animal abuse, I essentially try to skirt it altogether. It's, it, it's often very, very difficult and very, very prone to tangential discussion if you try to dig into a theological debate with someone about the consumption of animals. Not only are you starting off on the wrong foot where they have a much larger knowledge base than you, it's, it's a giant winding rabbit hole that very rarely has light at the end of that rabbit hole. Instead, what I usually do is ask them and simply affirm to them, you say that your religion gives you the framework of choice to choose whether you pay for these products. And usually the answer is yes. And then through that, you can essentially skirt that whole issue and go, okay, why do you, within that framework, why do you make that choice? Um, can I also just add, um, this is just sort of an aside, but it kind of links a little bit into what Kai just said. Um, I was actually invited to a group to present what, what I've been doing within the Animal Justice Party to um, a religious leaders organisation. So it had religious leaders from, um, I think about 14 different religions. And I spoke about my veganism, I spoke about animal rights, I spoke about the different work that we're doing in, um, in, in, in Parliament. I mean, some of them even had a lot of questions about bees and how to protect bees. Um, but across every religious um, denomination, they all said, um, this is fantastic work and this is the future and we can see that this is exactly where things are going. So, yeah. Yeah, awesome. Thanks so much, guys. Um, hand over to you, Kramer. Yep, thank you. Um, so there are a couple of questions here regarding the, I suppose, effectiveness of pushing a sort of public health message. So, you know, something along the lines of, you know, plant-based foods are healthier, therefore we should be eating more of those and not meats and things like that. Um, do we think that is an effective strategy or what sort of, um, I suppose, what could we do to sort of implement that sort of messaging more broadly, if it's even worthwhile? If anyone would like to speak on this, especially Michael, you might want to talk about health and retention and something like that. Sure. Um, I, I don't know if I have a conclusive answer for that question. What I, what I can maybe do is uh, just help to think about it a little bit. So there's, uh, the question is about how effective would it be to um, say, like launch a public health campaign, I guess in the, in the, um, same kind of way that we had like the anti-smoking campaigns. That's the way I'm interpreting the question. So um, the, I think there's two separate things here. So first is the question of how effective would it be if the government just did that tomorrow? The second question is how effective is it for you as an individual or an organization to advocate for that to happen? And I, I think those are two separate things because you know the, the, um, the government just saying, we're gonna do this tomorrow. Uh, and then doing that could be really effective, but that, you know, as an individual, you have to think about um, how likely are you to convince the government to do that? Uh, and so I guess, yeah, that's, that's a separate question. Um, uh, so, and then for the, for the other part, I mean, about how effective would it actually be to, to run that campaign? Um, my, my, I, 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 look, I don't know, but I think, if you want to compare it to something like the anti-smoking campaign, which was quite effective, um, I think it, 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 it could be great. I, I have a worry though that is, it's similar in the sense that it's focused on health, but as a, as a cultural and societal norm, consuming animal products I think is just more embedded than smoking. And so for that reason, it might be a lot harder um, for a public health campaign focused on uh, getting people to stop consuming animal products or consuming less fewer animal products or whatever. Uh, and so I, I suspect just on that, uh, in that sense, it might be less effective. Um, that's a long way of me saying I have no idea, I guess. Can I add a, a little bit to that as well, if that's all right? Um, first of all, I just want to say with the smoking campaigns, a lot of the campaigns that we're all familiar with, with the really graphic um, health warnings and illness and disease photos that was actually targeted at children. Um, so from as, so they actually got a health psychologist, which is where I work, and they wanted to make smoking gross to people who weren't smoking. 
Um, so those ads were somewhat effective with people who already smoked, but they were actually targeted at the next generation to make them disgusted with smoking. And if you speak, when I was a kid, we thought that smokers were cool. You speak to kids these days and they see someone smoking, they walk up to you and they say, you, you're gross, that's disgusting. So they've actually created a generational shift in attitude. Um, so that's what the difference is with those smoking. That's why Michael was sort of like throwing them around. Um, and while I agree it would be hard to do a health campaign, I think if we just look at the health message on its own, um, it's an interesting one when we're talking about advocating for plant-based diets because um, people um, are more open to the message. So in psychology, we talk about cognitive dissonance. And so cognitive dissonance and um, anybody that's done some of that street one-on-one -on -one activism would be very familiar with cognitive dis dissonance where people come up with excuses not to change their behaviour or they become so distressed thinking about what happens to animals that they close off and they try not to think about it. Um, that's because we inherently don't want to change our behaviours. So that cognitive dissonance comes in and the doors close. When you're talking about health, it's a much easier message. So if you show somebody what the health, it's an easier documentary to watch than Earthlings or Dominion, where people get so overly upset that they sort of shut that message down and don't want to hear it anymore. Um, what I think then happens, if somebody goes plant-based for health reasons, I think that they're more open to the animal protection message because they don't have that guilt factor and the cognitive dissonance already set in. The problem, though, is that they have to get that animal protection message while they're vegan for health reasons. Because I think if somebody goes vegan just for health reasons, then they're much more likely to reverse back to their old ways. They're less likely to stick to it than somebody who's gone vegan for purely ethical reasons. Because when you make a decision for ethical reasons, you know, you've really thought through all the issues and you've made a real commitment. Uh, whereas we've all done a healthier eating plan and not stuck to it, so it's much easier to reverse. So I think that, yes, you can do a health message, but you have to make sure that the person that's then made a commitment um, to, to go vegan for health, health reasons then also gets the ethical message as well um, without them sort of reversing back. I hope that helps. Could I just add one more point quickly to that that Emma just reminded me of? Um, and it's a kind of a, 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 not a nice thought, but I worry about um, it, sometimes with promoting the health message and the environmental message for veganism uh, of another unintended consequence. And that is that um, if you convince people about the uh, environmental harms of animal products or the, the, the harms to the health of animal products, it might push them away from say something like um, red meat from cows, which is most, one of the most environmentally damaging and harmful to health products. It might push them not necessarily to plant products, but it might push them to say chickens or fishes uh, and to get the same, the same number of meals from chickens or fishes results in more chickens or fishes uh, dying than, than cows. So, and if you look at the US, the, um, the, uh, number of cows being farmed is roughly stable, maybe even decreasing a little bit, but the number of chickens uh, and fishes being consumed is increasing by a lot. Uh, and I don't know exactly why that is, but I, I wonder if that's partly because of um, those reasons, people becoming more health and environmentally conscious. So yeah, just to reiterate Emma's point about making sure that um, you can use the health and environmental messages, but make sure it's um, backed up by the ethical message as well. Awesome. Thanks so much, guys. Um, next question, um, more for Emma and Tara. Um, in an ideal situation, the property status of animals is abolished, their sentience is legally recognised, and current industry exemptions for animal cruelty would be removed. Um, do you think that currently the most effective way to make legal change for animals is through the incriminalist approach, um, such as single issue campaigns, or how do we scale up and influence and contribute to big shifts for animals in government, law and politics. And if you also just had any um, advice for anyone seeking a career in law or politics, if you could just add that at the end as well, um, that would be awesome too. Uh, I can start off on that one. Uh, yeah, so look, this is uh, something that we grapple with uh, in the Animal Defenders Office and I'm sure any sort of similar organisation 
focusing on animal law, and that is what is the best approach? Is it the incremental sort of inherently welfareist approach uh, or is it the sort of abolitionist approach? Now, while with an activist hat on, you might be an abolitionist. I just don't know how far you're going to get being a, a lawyer and working within the sort of legal profession, within the legal system with that um, with that approach. Gary Francione, lo love him or hate him, he does... Uh, he certainly, he's an abolitionist, of course, but he also thinks that you can have law reform uh, from an animal rights sort of basis. Um, in other words, with a sort of animal rights uh, sort of objective. Um, so so it's, it's a difficult path to tread, uh, um, but we certainly think that any change that's going to improve uh, the, the plight of animals is a positive. And so, so while we will sort of um, not so much embrace, but at least support the incrementalist change, we do have our focus on, on our, any kind of abolitionist change. And we do get those, for example, in the ACT, um, recently uh, the whole greyhound racing industry was banned. So that would, that would even conform to Francione's sort of a notion of abolitionist or animal rights uh, sort of reform, uh, because you are abolishing an entire practice. So you certainly can get that, but um, and that's great when you when you can achieve it. But uh, I would say that you would just um, uh, you, you know you've just it's it's up to the individual. But um, we we support any change that um, can be achieved through law reform that will improve the plight of animals today in the here and now. While, while continuing to um, uh, pursue those greater uh, reforms um, down the track. Um, thanks, Tara. Um, so for me, everything, everything that I can achieve in parliament comes down to the numbers and who I have to convince. So for, at the moment, the way that the House sits, for me to get legislation passed in the upper house or notices of motion or calls to papers, I have to convince the Greens, they're not too hard. I have to convince all of Labor, they're a little bit harder, but not entirely impossible. And then on top of that, I either have to have the shooters, fishers and farmers supporting me, or One Nation supporting me, or the Christian Democrats. So this is what I'm up against to try to get things through. Um, now, I've, I, I've been picking certain campaigns, and that doesn't mean that we don't take things in that are really important that just have to be addressed because they have to be addressed. Um, we will still do some of that as well, but as far as actually getting things effectively through, we have to talk to everyone across those parties to get the numbers for things to pass. So at the moment, um, next week, what we're tabling is tougher penalties for acts of animal cruelty. Um, so that's the sort of thing. Now, this will affect all animals. Um, so if we can get the penalties increased in New South Wales, that will be for any act of animal cruelty. It's not just companion animals, um, but it would also include farmed animals. Um, so we're looking at the moment, the maximum's $5,500 for an act of standard, standard animal cruelty. We're the lowest in any state and territory around the country. Um, we're looking at increasing that to over 50,000. Um, essentially, and we want the jail sentence to move from six months to up to a year. Um, essentially, we need to raise the bar and recognise that an act of animal cruelty is a very, very serious crime. Um, the other work that we've been doing is around domestic violence and animal abuse. Again, that applies to all species of animals. Um, so if somebody had a goat um, and, and um, an abusive partner was using the goat as a form of intimidation, that will now become a, an act of crime within the Crimes Act, and that's come through our work in that particular space. Um, so it's sometimes about picking campaigns that we know we can get parties on board. We're also doing a big campaign on puppy farming. Um, I know I've got the numbers in the upper house on that particular campaign, for example. Um, companion animals are a lot easier to work on because there is support, broad support from some of those other parties. Um, but there are areas where we can work on like that penalty system where we can get more broad support, which would actually work to protect all species. And we've got an election in two years. And again, 
it will all entirely depend on where those numbers fall. If we end up in the upper house and I don't need those conservative right-wing MPs um, and it's just Greens and Labor, we'll be able to set up much bigger things like an independent office of animal protection. Um, but while I have to try and get um, One Nation, One Nation and the Christian Democrats are, are somewhat um, open to animal issues, um, or, or the shooters um, who are much, much less likely to come on side with us, but um, that, that's what we're working with. Hopefully it'll change in two years. Awesome. Thanks so much, Emma. Um, Graham, I'll hand it to you. Okay, so this questioner has sort of two related questions. The first is, um, I suppose, what is it that's sort of done to get businesses and corporations to make positive change for animals? So I guess in mind here would be something like, you know, McDonald's um, pledging to, you know, phase out battery cages or um, something along those lines. And the other question is, um, how do these sorts of corporate changes affect um, political legislative change? This is for anyone. I don't want to keep jumping in, but <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll have a little go. Hopefully some people will, will have something to add to what I'm saying. Um, when um, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of an example. One campaign that I ran, I went to um, a whole lot of outback towns in New South Wales and Queensland, and I filmed undercover wild goat racing events. Um, I then e um, got this footage. I emailed the sponsors, I worked out who was sponsoring this, which was Qantas and Origin, uh, were two of the main sponsors. I emailed them and I told them the footage. I got a vet expert report to look through the footage um, to show the extent of the cruelty that was happening at these events. I got no response. I set up an online petition. Um, it only got to 800 signatures, sharing it on social media. It got to 800 signatures before Qantas rang up and said they're pulling out. Um, we had to go a bit harder on origin. Um, so, you know, you can create social media campaigns. I ended up going to the media and getting a big story with Today Tonight because I had all that footage. Um, and then origin pulled out as well. And then that collapsed um, um, the whole event. So I think you've just got to think about where, you know, you've got to reach out to these places. You've got to try and get meetings. Um, go with all of your information. So when I used to go and meet with Coles and Woolworths, um, I'd go fully prepared to show them the statistics and say, you know, we're the third fastest vegan growing um, country in the world. Um, this is how popular these food products are. If you can buy them in bulk and make it cheaper, um, people will come and buy it from you. Um, so you've got to come in, I guess, prepared with your argument and just try and get these people across the table. Um, and that's what Peter does with um, huge organisations, um, you know, to get more vegan stuff on the menu. But I think it's, you know, you can sort of take those tools and use it. In regards to um, political effect, um, I think it does. Um, it's interesting because um, the Liberal national government, everything that we talk about in the House, they say, let consumers decide, let consumers decide. Um, but of course, um, I mean, they use that argument with caged eggs, for example. Now, the majority of eggs in the market are still caged eggs. And the reason for that isn't because consumers are still buying them, it's because caged eggs are being used within products where people don't realise they're actually buying caged eggs. So if they buy a pie or a muffin or um, you know, a, a piece of cake or if they get a salad with egg in it that's been come from a catering company, that's all caged eggs. That's why the majority of eggs are still caged. Um, so they're not actually allowing the market to decide. So um, I think it's about sort of building those arguments and pulling them into that political sphere. I think it was um, Jonathan Saffron Froer, and I don't know the exact quote, but it's brilliant. And he says, um, you know, we don't need the option of lead paint on children's toys. Um, we don't need the consumer option of and, and listed all these sorts of things that we, we don't legally allow someone to sell because there shouldn't ever have to be an option for these things. And he said it's the same for products that are destroying the environment and, and cruel to animals. We don't need that as an option. Um, and so it's up to us to legislate to get rid of it. Excellent. Thank you, Emma. Um, I might just ask Tara, should, should we expect... Um, 
that, you know, if we do get these sorts of corporate changes, so for instance, you know, um, large companies phasing out battery cages or something along those lines, that it would make it easier to get um, legislative change in that it might sort of alter the legal understanding of like, you know, necessary suffering of animals for human purposes, something along those lines? Um, I, I'm, I think that would uh, probably go back to this idea of sort of research into, you know, what, what leads to this kind of sort of change and, um, you know, what are the sort of most uh, useful inputs, etc. cetera. I, I, I'm just not aware of that, that kind of link. Um, but uh, I think it's, it's more, I mean, well, a factor as well has got to be just a push from the general community. So an example would be um, in the ACT, uh, where uh, being the only jurisdiction in Australia that has uh, legislated or has acknowledged animal sentience in law, uh, and not just sort of anywhere in law, in the actual objects clause of the um, Animal Welfare Act. So a pretty important part because that um, then influences how courts, etc., and decision makers are to interpret the whole Animal Welfare Act. Uh, and so that would itself make an interesting case study how we went from so when we uh, uh, lobbied our politicians in the lead up to the 2016 election we um, actually broached the issue of animal sentience to all the parties uh, um, who were contesting that election and said where do you stand on the idea of acknowledging animal sentience and most of them including the Labor Party uh, weren't even aware of it didn't know what we were talking about and yet in the space of that um, term of government, uh, the ACT, uh, and we continued to lobby and, and um, so did other organisations. And, and they ended up actually uh, amending the legislation to, to acknowledge uh, sentience. So um, that, I mean, that was probably just coming from the community um, rather than say from a corporate, but, but, but yeah my basic position is that I'm just not aware of, of, of that link. Sure. Thank you. Thanks for that. Though. That was in interesting. Um, okay. Sitar. Mm. Um, next question. How can the links with animal agriculture and climate change epidemics, pandemics be given more social awareness as these issues impact and are on everyone's mind yet the wider community excludes the root cause being animal agriculture. Anyone? I think that you've got to be. I think you've got to be careful um, because it's an easy thing to to say, and then it's also very um, people think it's an easy thing to dispute as well. But there, there, um, you know, it's a fact that these places are filthy and they're breeding grounds for diseases and things like that. So whether you can make a statement that this is the cause of the current pandemic or not you can definitely make a case for um you know for diseases that have already come from these places and um, different types of things that could possibly come in the future and yeah most people have absolutely no idea of that and so sharing it with uh you know the videos that are out there and this and that again just sharing it to your friends and family can be influential and um, just, just, it's just another reason for people to um, take this issue seriously. So just to add, add to it, and um, also people are interested in current news and current events. So it's something, it's an opportunity for you to mention animal rights and get that topic on the table using the current situation. Thank you, James. I just have one example of, I guess, some kind of something, some action like that. So there was a open letter to the World Health Organization a few years ago from a number of scientists and prominent individuals um, asking the World Health Organization to acknowledge the link between animal agriculture and global antibiotic resistance. Um, so the, because a lot of antibiotics are fed to animals in farms, and in fact, that's the main use of antibiotics in the world, not um, for medicinal use for humans. Um, and that's accelerating global antibiotic resistance, which some estimates say could result in um, tens of millions or hundreds of millions of deaths um, within 40 years. So that, now to the best of my knowledge, that um, didn't result in any 
position change from the World Health Organization, but those kind of things of targeting um, something like the World Health Organization for health or some, something similar for environment, maybe the UN, um, to say, you know, you, your goal is to uh, support the health of people in the world and here's the link. So do something about it. Um, yeah, hopefully that kind of thing works, but yeah, we'll see. Sorry, I was on mute. Thank you so much. Um, I'll hand it over to Kramer. Cool, thank you, Satara. So we have kind of a few questions here on a similar topic. Um, and the question is um, how to, I guess, stay positive and mentally healthy um, despite being aware of all these sort of ongoing significant issues for animals. So for instance, live export is one thing here, or you can imagine greyhound racing or, you know, anything else. Um, so I think James talked about this a bit earlier with, you know, staying happy and, you know, allowing yourself to be enjoying life and things like that. Um, are there any sort of particular techniques that anyone here uses or any strategies or any thoughts on this? Yeah, I'll, I'll, um, I'll chime in on this. Um, there's, I guess, two aspects of it. Um, the first I'd say is when you look at um, how to maintain your mental health, um, I think see it as the utility that it brings. Um, I'm, this approach works for some, but I um, have never really particularly resonated with the whole like, uh, sort of like self-love sort of um, really, I don't know, looking up to yourself sort of thing. I, I see my mental health as purely a like function of how much impact I can create. And obviously with that, um, if one is mentally unhealthy, they're gonna be able to create a smaller amount of impact. Um, it's, I think it's sometimes easy to fall into these sort of like lofty philosophical justifications um, that you can tell yourself um, sort of about like the relativism of suffering in that when you're so hyper aware of what Adam was going through and the sheer scale of it, admittedly, we can never truly understand the sheer scale of the suffering that's going on. But having that, there tends to be this comparison, I think sometimes you find to your own suffering and that whether it's you know exposing yourself to traumatic footage or exposing yourself to overworking or anything like that, where you can sort of encompass this mentality where it doesn't matter how bad my suffering is, um, their suffering is always worse. And so you neglect that aspect of things. And really that doesn't seem to map very well onto a, a utilitarian approach to things. Um, the way I look at mental health is through the utilitarian lens, like I said, as purely a measure of how effective I can be and the more happy and the more healthy I am, the more effective I can be. And I guess lastly is the what I would want to add is I think oftentimes in neglected aspect of things, one thing I chimed in on before in the introduction is surround yourself with people who call it purpose. That is such a key instrumental factor in maintaining one's mental health. I don't know how I would have survived simply as a vegan, let alone an animal advocate, if I was just doing this solo. And whether that's engaging with people at a variety of different things, um, surround yourself with people all the time and you'll find it's so much easier to maintain your mental health. Oh, and Ayanti has a really good workshop on. Thanks so much, Kai. Um, anyone else had anything to add for that point? Um, I, I guess I just want to acknowledge that, um, yeah, it can be really, really hard sometimes to manage your mental health and to stay optimistic in the face of, um, you know, the problems that we see. Um, yeah, and I, I don't know if there's really an easy, simple solution. Uh, I, I mean, I can just say personally, I, um, yeah, have battled um, burnout, depression on and off for, for years. And a part of that being because of what we see happening to animals. And sometimes it helps me to use that as motivation. Sometimes it doesn't. And I, I just burn out. Um, uh, I don't know, I guess, um, yeah, it's, it's a, a tricky a problem that we all need to I guess, find our own approach to, but also to um, look at a lot of the resources out there on um, mental health and maintaining maintaining our health. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much, Michael. 
Um, I think we're just about running out of time now. So we may have to leave the Q&A at that point. Um, just want to say a great thank you to all the panelists for joining. We have such an awesome lineup and I'm so grateful that you all um, took time out of your day to join. So thank you so much for um, joining tonight and to all the audience members as well for tuning in. We've had an awesome amount of people tune in and it's been really great to see how many people are so interested in this topic. Um, just a quick plug in for Young AJP as well. If you are aged between 14 to 28 and are not a member of Young AJP and living in New South Wales, would definitely love for you to join. Um, we have a lot of exclusive opportunities and events for members um, or any of your friends or family you think would be keen to join, definitely do let them know. Um, we'd love to have you. Um, I think that's about it from our end. So might just leave everyone to it. Thank you so much for joining and I hope you all have a nice evening. Ciao. Bye. Thanks, everyone. See you later.